What is new and different about Israel's new extreme rightist government? And what isn't? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Mu'in Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Gideon Levy. Gideon Levy is an award-winning Israeli author and journalist. He has reported for Haaretz newspaper since 1982, where he writes the weekly column, The Twilight Zone, about Israeli policies towards the Palestinians. Gideon Levy, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you, Moan, and it's a great pleasure for me to see you again and to participate in your show. Thank you, and it's uh, really great to have you uh, on it. Um, so perhaps along the lines of, of my initial question, many people have described this uh, new Israeli government, led once again by Benjamin Netanyahu, as a radical departure from previous Israeli governments. Others have said, actually, we should see it primarily in the context of continuities. And yet others have said we need to make a distinction between the changes it is seeking to introduce within the Green Line to continuities outside it. How would you characterize this new government? Look, Moine, this government is two weeks old. Mm -hmm. It started really in a turmoil, in a storm, almost unexpected storm led by not Netanyahu, but his partners who took over. And at least the rhetoric and the, and the intentions seem to be more radical than I thought and more rapid than I thought. Those people have no borders right now. I thought it will end up uh, with continuation of, of the bad old past. But it seems that it's getting worse in many ways, mainly in legislation, but not only. But after two weeks, it's really hard to judge because it might be, you know, a big beginning. There are those shows that start, you know, in flying colors, and very soon uh, we'll get back to, to, to reality. So by and large, I am happy about the turmoil. I'm happy about the storm, because what we were witnessing in the last decades was a terrible, terrible status quo in which everything was covered up Everyone lived in peace with many things which took place under the surface. And there was no call for change, neither from the Israelis nor from the international community. Maybe we are facing now the end of this masquerade and the beginning of a certain alarm. Listen, guys, something terrible is going on. But having said that, looking at the initial international responses, you had um, Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, talking about uh, shared values um, and congratulating the new government. Um, Europeans have largely taken um, a similar attitude. On what basis would you be hopeful that the international community, and particularly the West, might this time say that finally Israel has gone too far and needs to be confronted? It will happen only if Israel will force them to react. Through there its actions. Certain... Sorry? Through its actions, you mean? Through its actions, exactly. Uh, because the credit, the card blunt that Israel has is almost unlimited. I mean, I think that Israel can do almost whatever it wants and still become or stay the darling of the West without almost no borders. But somewhere there will be a reality in which we will force them, even though they don't want it, but we might force them, push them to the corner in a situation in which they will not be able to, to keep silent. Now, I'm not uh, expecting much from the international community. For sure not, I'm not expecting to actions. And rhetoric will not make any change because Israel learned to live with all the condemnations. Israel couldn't care less about it. It's all about the question if we are reaching a point in which the 
international community will take some measures against Israel. This seems right now far away, but if this government will get into this momentum of getting crazy and really take horrible measures, we can find ourselves within a few weeks in a new reality. And then the world and above all the United States and the EU will have to react. They will not be able to cover up everything. You see, you mentioned Blinken. He's already rushing to Israel in the coming days to try to, to calm things down. I'm not sure he can do it. Let's then um, perhaps take a closer look at the policies of this new government, taking into account your point that it's only two weeks old and it might be premature. But I think there are already um, several indications of where it intends to go. I suggest we start by looking at its domestic policies and particularly those policies that most affect um, the Israeli voters and um, uh, the Jewish community globally in terms of its um, legislation about Jewish identity and the like. Uh, much has been made, for example, about um, the Netanyahu government's attempt to recalibrate the Israeli judicial system, um, about um, uh, statements and eventually policies about um, uh, definition of who is a legitimate Jew, about uh, gay rights and the like. Do you see any significant changes here or is this also in the realm of uh, rhetoric? It's not, in, it's not only rhetoric because even if they continue other governments, they expose now the truth. And the truth is very disturbing. The, the racist character of Zionism and of Israel is now being exposed. It's not that they invented it. They didn't even start it, but they expose it, first of all, to the Israelis and then to the world. Now, about domestic questions, as you asked, uh, they will take some measures, but uh, I'm not worried about the fate of the gay community in Israel, for example, because they are strong enough and well connected and they will not be able to go all the way as they wish. I think that all this is minor relatively to what they plan towards the Palestinian community, both the Israeli Palestinians, the Israeli citizens who are Palestinians and above all the Palestinians in the West Bank. And here I see that the legislation has a very clear purpose. And the purpose is to, ex first of all, the first purpose will be to exclude the Israeli Arabs, the Israeli Palestinians from the political game. For this, they have to neutralize the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court wouldn't let it happen. Once they neutralize the Supreme Court, the way is open. And sorry, and this will be achieved by giving parliament um, basically a right to veto over any court rulings. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. That, that's the idea right now. And this is almost already on its way in a process of legislation, but it's not only about, uh, I mean, that's not the goal, that's a mean, I think. The goal is to reach, but that's just my, my speculation. The real goal is to get into a situation in which all the Arab parties will not be able to run to the parliament. They will find, I mean, the excuses are already there, if you don't recognize Israel as a democratic state and a Jewish state, you cannot run. If you are supporting terror, which is something very vague, you cannot run. And very soon we'll find ourselves, we might find ourselves with a Jewish parliament. Or Basically Jewish through the banning of Arab parties. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how, would this, how would this work? Because in addition to political parties, you also have a large number of civic organizations that um, either defend or promote uh, 
the human and civil and political rights of Palestinian citizens of Israel, do you see those being eventually banned as well? Sure, it goes without saying. I mean, if they banned and closed six organizations, civil society organizations in the, the, in the West Bank, the way to do the same among the Israeli-Palestinian community is very short. Mm -hmm. It will be the same considerations, the same uh, uh, justifications, and you are there. Mm -hmm. But I must tell you that those are not a real obstacle because unfortunately their power is very limited in Israeli society and their influence is very limited. And I don't think that this is uh, a great achievement for the government because it's not a game changer. So it's We're, really about the political parties in your view. Absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and the important thing to be uh, mentioned here is that this will gain a lot of support in Israeli society. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that they are going against the society. That's the national um, popular sentiment. We want it to be Jewish. The parties, the Palestinian parties are supporting terror. They, their, their loyalty is with the Palestinians, not with Israel. They are traitors and therefore they have no place in Israeli politics. I think we are very close to reach this. And assuming for the sake of argument that that reality is going to be reached, um, what do you see as its implications? Again, looking at it um, within Israeli terms, we of course had um, uh, the large scale demonstrations and uprising by um, Palestinian communities in Israel in the summer of, uh, of 2020. Do you see something similar developing or do you think the repressive powers of the state will successfully work to prevent that? How do, where do you see things developing there? Look, if the Palestinians, the Israeli Palestinians will be by themselves, the establishment will smash them very easily by force, by very brutal force. And the measures are taken. Many troops, I mean, it will be very brutal. But if a meaningful Jewish camp will not join them in solidarity and in action, not only in talkings, then uh, they have no chance. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm very skeptical about Jews supporting them and joining them. We see now there is a wave of, of protest in Israel of the Zionist left and center. There was one demonstration last Saturday, the coming Saturday, it will be even bigger. People are disturbed. By the but all almost all of them keep distance from the Palestinians. It's about they issues do. like the judiciary and and so on. Yes, and but they don't want the Palestinians to join them. They don't want Palestinian flags. They do because they believe that this will uh, push away. Delegitimize them exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if this goes like this, and I believe it will go like this. I can assure you that the Palestinian protest, as strong as it will be, will be smashed. Yeah. So let's then um, look outside the Green Line um, to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. As you well know, and as you have documented on a weekly basis, um, the last year under the um, uh, Bennett and Lapid government, saw the highest rates of killings of Palestinians since 2005 uh, in the West Bank. Um, nevertheless, you also seem to suggest that we may be on the verge of another significant change in Israeli policy uh, in the West Bank. Where do you see things developing there? I'm uh, under a very strong influence of a visit I did uh, yesterday in the Jenin refugee camp, which is a very, very special place. I've not been there for four years and I went there. I mean, they don't want any Israelis there, including not Israeli journalists, except of very few exceptions. 
the IDF doesn't dare to get into the camp. The PA doesn't dare for years to get into the camp. And after many years in which I was very skeptical about the, the spirit of the Palestinians in the West Bank, in Jenin, I saw yesterday a real strong spirit of struggle, which really encouraged me a lot. But I know that Jenin is very, very exceptional. Mm -hmm. When you go through the West Bank, you see that the Palestinians are maybe in one of their worst moments, maybe it's the worst moment ever since 48. No leadership, no spirit, obviously no unification, no support from outside, no support from the Arab world, no support from the West, really bleeding along the roads without any assistance and any, any hope. Can this change? Maybe, I don't know. First of all, they lack leadership. Secondly, they have to get more united. By the way, again, in Jenin, in the refugee camp of Jenin, you see all the organizations working together. Jihad and, and the other Everyone martyrs does. brigades yeah. were yeah, carrying yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it has a lot of power. The, the strongest organization in, in Jenin is, is the Islamic Jihad, mm -hmm. but they all go together. Mm -hmm. This is what I was told, and I tend to believe it. This you can't see in other places. So the Palestinians are by far too weak right now. Maybe things will change, but they are by far too weak and too lonely and, and still bleeding from the second Intifada to go for another uprising. I don't see an uprising. I see continuous of the individual protest, individual, individuals and, and certain villages and certain places who go more for protest, Nablus, uh, some villages, Jenin obviously, but this will not create an uprising unless something very dramatic will happen. Well, if you look at it that way, the implication seems to be um, that given uh, the state of Palestinian weakness and fragmentation and regional and international isolation, that Israel can basically, um, with fairly limited resistance, do as it pleases in the West Bank. If, if that's an assessment you agree with, how would you characterize the Israeli agenda in the West Bank um, under this government and for the coming period? First of all, I totally agree. I mean, as it, as it looks now, Israel can do whatever it wants. Unless, for example, Hezbollah joins, unless, and this is, you can't exclude it, even though it's not probable right now, uh, unless Hamas uh, goes for some major actions, which I'm also not sure uh, will be the scenario. But if you look at the West Bank by itself, quite helpless. And uh, what is the agenda is a great problem question because the question is, does Israel have an agenda? Uh, many people think that Israel doesn't have a, a clear agenda. It is being motivated mainly by domestic politics to show the right-wingers, to so show the nationalists that we are doing something, to show the bloodthirsty Israelis that we are taking revenge about every terror action, but without a strategic goal. So the agenda is a status quo, basically. It's, it's never a status quo, you know, it's a status quo, but while we are speaking about the status quo, you triple the number of the settlers. The violence of the settlers is today much worse than ever before. And also the brutality of the army is, is getting worse and worse. So it's not really a status quo. You can't compare the West Bank of today to the West Bank of five, even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Not in terms of settlements, not in terms of the behavior of the army. Mm -hmm. But some kind of status quo 
in which the final goal, I believe, for, for many right-wingers in Israel is to get rid from as many Palestinians as possible. How to do it? Nobody knows. But I think many Israelis did not lose the hope to make this land all Jewish. But you haven't mentioned formal annexation as part of the Israeli agenda. Is, do, you, do you believe that it's basically committed to continuing the existing policy of creeping annexation and seeking to avoid um, uh, very visible public measures that could result in an international response? I don't see much importance in annexating the West Bank when it is practically annexated. There is no and need for it. No need for it. Mm -hmm. And the price will be, might be enormous. Because this might be a red line for the Americans and the EU. This is one of the things that they will not be able to remain indifferent and passive. They will have to take some measures after annexation. And, you know, Netanyahu for sure doesn't want annexation. What for? The problem is that the, the other partners want everything and now, and he's quite taking hostage by them, at least as it looks right now, maybe it will change, but until now, he seems to be taken hostage by them. And then the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. But if it depends on Netanyahu, I think he will do anything possible to avoid it because also there is no need. I mean, what for, what will be the difference? The West Bank was annexated, I think, 55 years ago. But you might say not 55 years ago, 20 years ago. But it is practically annexated. It's part and parcel of Israel. And this is one of the core issues. We have to stop seeing the occupation as a temporary phenomena. Mm -hmm. And if it's not temporary, it's not an occupation. If it's not temporary, it's part and parcel of Israel, which means it defines the regime of Israel. And, and this defines Israel as an apartheid state, no other way to describe it. And, and that's an issue that is now being submitted by the Palestinians to the International Court of Justice. And look what Israel is doing them. I mean, it's unbelievable. Whatever the Palestinians are doing, they are punished. Whatever. Everything is labeled as terror, diplomatic terror, financial terror, a propaganda terror, everything is terror, no matter what. And whatever legitimate step, step they are taking, they are punished. But that's not the point. The question is if those institutions will start to act, because we saw it already in the international uh, uh, Supreme uh, Court in, in Den Haag. We had a prosecutor who started some measures, who went quite far in a very mysterious way. She was replaced. And now for one year, over one year, nothing is moving. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about the Palestinians, it's also about those institutions. Mm -hmm. They, someone has to push them to start to do things. Everything takes years. I mean, the question if the occupation is temporary or not can be answered within seconds. Mm -hmm. They will sit on it now for years. And in the meantime? In the meantime, Israel will try, as usual, to maintain some kind of normality in the West Bank with some kind of economical benefits. And uh, from time to time, there will be those violent waves, like we see from time to time, mainly by individuals. From time to time, something in Gaza. But the big explosion, Israel will try to postpone it, postpone, and meanwhile, build more and more settlements and take more and more lands. Um, the previous Netanyahu government uh, did have a strategic agenda, and that was developed and implemented in close coordination 
with the Trump administration in Washington, and that was to seek normalization with conservative Arab monarchies in order to push the Palestinian question um, further down the regional and international agenda. Many people would say, particularly in light of the state of Palestinian weakness and fragmentation that you've described, that it has proven to be, in certain important respects, a success. Do you see it as continuing in the coming period? Again, it depends if Israel will be cautious enough not to force them mm -hmm. to change the policy. You see, after Ben Gvir went to the Temple Mountain, to Al-Aqsa, Netanyahu's visit in, uh, in the Emirates was canceled. postponed, yeah. mainly canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a price for Israel, that's a personal price for Netanyahu. For Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. So as much as the Emirates, for example, and I've been there and I talk to some of their leaders, diplomats, they are fed up with the Palestinians. But there is a point in which they cannot continue as if nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And if Israel will push them, then this strategy will, will fail, Israel's strategy. Until now, it's a hell of a success. Mm -hmm. A hell of a success. Netanyahu proved that we can get recognition by big part of the Arab world without doing anything about the Palestinians, which is the opposite of the paradigm that we always believed in, in which until we don't solve the Palestinian problem, no normaliz normalization can be possible. Netanyahu came and had proven that here we have normalization. Uh, one key issue is obviously Saudi Arabia, who is the next candidate. But if this government will continue with those crazy steps, like provocative steps, uh, the Saudi Arabia cannot join it, and then this whole strategy can collapse. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd like to turn now to a um, somewhat related subject, which is the issue of, um, you spoke about Israel constantly denouncing any Palestinian initiative as terrorism. Internationally, um, any criticism of Israel or its policies or condemnation is denounced as anti-Semitism. Um, how do you see this as um, both a successful Israeli strategy? I mean, we had now an incident where someone who um, through most of his career was an ardent supporter of Israel, Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch, being denied a fellowship at Harvard University because Human Rights Watch recently characterized Israel as an apartheid state. Um, how do you see this policy playing out? And particularly, do you see its successes as potentially further alienating traditional supporters of, uh, of Israel? I can only hope. Until now, it's, it's one of the most genius strategies. It is efficient everywhere, not only in, in Europe, where Israel is playing on the guilt feelings, but also in the United States, very efficient. It had paralyzed any criticism about Israel try to post a, a critical article about, uh, about Israel in one of the big newspapers in the West, it will be very hard to get published, very hard. I've been once in Berlin in a conference of solidarity, innocent solidarity movement with the Palestinians. They couldn't find a venue in Berlin. Nobody would let them held their conference, we had to go to a copt monastery 200 kilometers from Berlin where a 80-year-old Egyptian a, a monk let us uh, gather there. It was really embarrassing, but it's not only Germany. And uh, that's the challenge more of, of the West than of the Palestinians and of the Israelis. Will there be enough courageous Western people who will speak out and say, we are dealing now with, with our own democracy. 
We are dealing now with freedom of speech in our countries. And we cannot play along the manipulation that Israel is, or to surrender to the cynical manipulation that Israel is operating. Mm -hmm. Until now, I didn't hear these voices. Nobody is courageous enough to, no, not nobody, but nobody from the mainstream is ready to stand up and say enough is enough. We have the full right, not to right, the duty to criticize Israel. Nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Those voices, until now, I didn't hear them. Looking now again at the larger picture, um, you've, you've made the point earlier in this discussion um, that as far as you're concerned, the annexation took place 55 years ago with, with the beginning of the occupation. You've for many years um, taken the position that a um, two-state settlement is simply no longer possible and is off the agenda. Um, where do you see things developing in that respect, particularly now that we are probably seeing the twilight of both the PLO and the Palestinian Authority, and um, therefore the chief Palestinian advocates of a two-state settlement may no longer be on the scene for much longer themselves. Look, when for many, many years I claimed that the occupation cannot last forever, that this reality cannot last forever. In recent years, I'm not so sure anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to say it cannot last forever, it's, it's very nice and very um, promising but it's very hard for me to draw a scenario in which the world, without the intervention of the world, nothing will happen. That's very clear. Israel will not change. Israelis will not get up one shining morning and say, let's change because it's not fair. This will not happen. It will only happen if Israelis will realize that the price that they pay is by far not worth this, this reality. But for this, you need someone to, to come and, and ask for the price. I don't see it happening. But I think that in any case, we should start with a new discourse. We, the Palestinians, the, the civil societies, we have to start to speak about this basic thing of equal rights. Let's forget about the settlements, forget about the boundaries, forget about the PA and forget about all those tools that didn't lead us to anywhere. I mean, it's 55 years, we didn't reach anything. It's a colossal failure. Maybe even though it looks right now quite far-fetched, but we have to start somewhere and the start should be to change the discourse, to concentrate only on equal rights between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Hmm. And let Israel say no, and let Israel declare itself officially as an apartheid state. And maybe this will be a wake up call for the world. And when you travel abroad, and particularly when you meet with um, younger members of the Jewish community in Europe and the United States and elsewhere, uh, they seem to have a fundamentally different uh, perspective and interpretation of the realities in Israel and Palestine than, for example, their parents' or grandparents' generation. Um, is, is this a source of, of hope and potential change in your view? So it goes to two directions. One direction is losing interest in Israel losing contact, losing interest. We are speaking now about the Jewish community, the young Jewish community. Yes. Many of them just uh, say, that doesn't interest me. I have nothing in common with those people. They don't interest me. This is not a very promising uh, tendency. I mean, on the other hand, mainly in the United States, much more than in Europe, you see and you know it better than I, what's going on in the campuses. There are very encouraging signs. 
Uh, in many ways, in the United States, the progressives are now more progressive than the progressives in Europe, which wasn't the case before. Mm. Europe is preoccupied now with other issues. The Palestinians are more or less in the, in the, the last uh, place in their list, much after environment and immigration and Ukraine, obviously, and and, and all those issues are here to stay. I mean, it's not issues which in one year will be solved. All of them, including Ukraine, is not going to be solved so quickly. But in the United States, you feel some change. I don't meet so much with Jewish communities because they tend to invite me much less than others. So I'm not someone to ask, but whenever I go, the places that I'm invited, you see, mainly in the States and in Canada, I must say, you see young, devoted Jewish, American or Canadians who are really fed up and who are ready to, to do things mm -hmm. against the occupation, against the apartheid. How will it develop? It's, it's not for me to judge. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then when you see that Israel is becoming kind of a, a key player um, in this global far-right alliance of, of populist uh, rightist leaders. Is this also something that you think could potentially serve as an, as an issue that would cause others to reconsider, let's say, the traditional unconditional and uncritical support that they have been giving Israel over the years? In Europe, I don't see it, unfortunately. I don't see the European left becoming more critical about Israel. They still don't dare, mm -hmm. neither in Germany, but also not in other countries, not in France, not in, not in the UK. I don't see it. Look what they did to, to Corbyn in, in, in the UK who tried to, uh, to present an alternative and, and look how he ended as an anti-Semite, as, as really what they invented on him. But they are still very powerful and it's a combination of the Israeli lobby and the Jewish lobby who are still very influential in Europe, which is quite remarkable because the, the figures are very small. Those communities are very small. Why are they so powerful? I really not, don't know, but I don't see it. Uh, it's not changing quick enough and it's not changing at all in many ways, uh, but maybe maybe things, you know, many times you see a small pro proce uh, process and all of a sudden there is- Rapid transformation. Exactly. Mm. I'm, I'm waiting for this rapid transformation. It didn't happen yet. On that note, um, Gideon Levy, thank you very much uh, for your time and for sharing your perspectives and insights with Connections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moen. And I can tell you if the, we would change roles and I would have asked you the same questions, we would have gotten more interesting answers. I, I, very, I very much doubt that, uh, Gideon, no, no, no. but uh, I'm glad the discussion was set up the way it was today. I enjoyed it very much, and thank you for hosting me, really. Thank you. And let's keep in touch. I look forward to it. Thank you, Gideon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.